Hey, happy holidays from Pretty Good Gaming. As you can tell, because you clicked on this, we made a uh, quick little Wii U buy guide. The best games to get for this season. Just going to make it short, but don't own any of the music or any of the rights. This is just a quick little guide I put together. It took a long time to put together. She's eating my finger. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully you like it. She does. So the first on this list, or should I say the bottom of the barrel, is Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. This game has beautiful, beautiful graphics and amazing music. The music in this always suits the mood regardless of where you're going and it seamlessly changes. So it's not like there's a loading screen for in between levels, but I do want to add that there are a lot of loading screens, well one for every single level and every time you do it the loading screen is almost 30 seconds, not quite, but that tends to add up because you'll die a lot. At least I did. Uh, in this game, it, maybe it's me, but Donkey Kong's jump seems really off. Well, actually all the Kongs. Their jump seems like it'll go just a little bit and then there's like a little quarter of, a, of that height jump more after that, and so it's really hard to get a hang of. I'm sure if you were to get a hang of it, this would be a lot better and easier to do. Uh, me personally, I played a little bit of the Donkey Kong Country back on SNES, and those seem fine, but here the, the mechanics of the jump just don't really seem to work out that great. Uh, this game is also two-player, but uh, honestly the two-player gets in the way. This game is far, far better as a one-player using the two Kongs versus two people using the Kongs separately. So if you play as one player, you could actually uh, use Donkey Kong to pick up Dixie Kong and you could use her abilities as Donkey Kong versus if you were to have uh, the two separate players, the player two would pretty much be idle watching. Uh, I don't know about you but that's not a great two player game. It's like 1.5 player. So this game is decently hard, it's a really good platformer, and uh, but the thing that gets me is the movement. It seems like you're supposed to go really quick and then stop and then go really quick and then make sure you don't go so quick. I kinda wanted a game that's either gotta go fast or puzzle it out, figure it out. But this goes in between them really quickly and also seamlessly. Um, the biggest flaws I felt about this was, like I said, the jumping, the platforming speed, and uh, the loading screens. Uh, honestly, this is just not as good as the Mario games, and it's frustratingly hard. So that is why this game is the bottom of the barrel. Next up on this list is number 11, Citizens of Earth. So this is actually a really cool game. It's not expensive, it's not high-end in graphics, and really not much of anything. But it's got an amazing, charming uh, story, and all of the game, well, the vast majority of the game is voiced over. There are a couple parts where you'll, oh, and then they'll say like a sentence. But the vast majority of this game is very uh, well written, well dialogued. Uh, this solid game is a RPG game where you take several citizens, many citizens as you can see here, uh, and sorry, I, I haven't beaten the game yet, but you take uh, a group of three citizens around the world, pretty much saving it. You are the vice president and you want to make your town and actually the world better. Um, some of the really big flaws of this game is that it's slow and tiresome and what I mean by that is that you'll be doing a lot of reading. Everything in this game is pretty much reading. And then, I mean not that that's bad, it'd be nice to be mixed up with something. But to follow that up is there are loading screens everywhere. In a door, loading screen. Going out here, loading screen. And then uh, it takes a couple seconds for it to kind of get into battle with the characters. So with the slow gameplay, not high action, followed by loading screens, and then repetitive uh, attack usage, you're going to find yourself kind of nodding off possibly. But if you don't nod off, this is a great, charming, witty game that makes fun of many political stances all around the world. And it has a beautiful background when uh, you fight. They're not all, all the same. In fact, here are a couple. And uh, it's really uh, tantalizing, might I say. 
Third on this list is Mario Kart. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, like, really? Number 10, Mario Kart? And sadly, yes. I mean, it's a good game, but it's not perfect. Uh, this game has an amazing amount of vehicles and courses. If I recall, there are, what, like 48 different courses? That's more than I'm ever used to. I mean, I think the most I've ever seen is like 16 or so, but I kind of dropped off around uh, Double Dash. Wow, it's been a minute. Uh, anyways, so this is a great party game, as always, as every Mario Kart. Uh, you could play this with up to four people, and it will be a blast because this game has a really good sense of leveling the playing field. You're in eighth place, have a star, have a bullet, have some mushrooms. You're in first place, take some uh, bananas. Be lucky to get a green turtle shell. But by doing so, this makes it to where poorer players or the uh, not so good players keep up with the better players. And this game also has, I believe, five difficulty settings. 50, 100, 150, 200, and mirror mode, which that's a lot of difficulty settings, so even the really good players, you'll have some hard times uh, trying to get the completionist bonus of this one. Some of the downfalls of this game is that, to me, it felt abnormally slippery. Most other Mario Kart games, you kind of do that uh, the drift boost, and it isn't too hard to get. And in this one, you just kind of slip around, water or not. All the carts I used kind of just didn't really float my boat. They seem more like hover cars. Other uh, downfalls of this game is that it is the same exact Mario Kart formula. There's really no in ingenuity into this other than, hey, Animal Crossing, Hyrule is here. Yeah, let's go get it. Another downfall of this game is that it should have some preset carts. Some of the uh, stats for the uh, carts and the parasols, they're a little uh, hard to figure out at first. It took me a minute, I mean it's not so hard, but it'd be nice for you to kind of just throw some preset carts and then maybe I could fine tune it afterwards. Another thing is I wish that there were more weapons. This, these weapons from the same old uh, Mario Kart formula, it's getting really stale for me. I personally did not feel it, and that is why this got number 10. It's a great game, but really old formula. Number 9 on this list is Hyrule Warriors, the Dynasty Warrior Zelda crossover that will leave you hacking and slashing for quite some time. So when this game first came out, I was really amazed to see that it was a Zelda hack and slash, and when I played it, I was actually pre uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, this game, although it's very easy, it's uh, well made in the sense that the combos are well put together. There are a, a lot of characters in this game. I believe you could play as almost 20 of them. You could even play as Ganondorf, Aghanim, I mean, Fee if you really wanted to. But there are tons and tons of characters from all sorts of timelines. Uh, one of the biggest things I thought this game had going for it was the story. Because at first, it's like, okay, it's another Zelda game. Uh, hey, look, Zelda is chic. Oh no, Ganondorf is coming. You know, that whole bit. But then, out of nowhere, the game breaks into all of the timelines, as portals open, and you go into other timelines to alter their course to bring it back to normal. It's weird, it's time travely, and it's really, really cool. Uh, some of the downsides of this game are that it is really predictable, and the enemies are actually really easy. The main way to kill the heavy boss-like enemies are to wait for them to kind of stagger or slow down to where that silver circle is above them, and then you gotta do his combo set once or twice, and then you'll do some sort of cutscene attack, which is okay, but it gets very tiresome between all the levels, all the difficulty settings, and all the characters. The other thing is that there are tons and tons of weapons in this game, but honestly there's only a few that are really cool and worth it. You'll find yourself testing all of them and then using one or two depending on the weaknesses of the of people. Another amazingly awesome thing that I mentioned earlier is the completionist bonus. Now, I haven't completed this game, as many people who have played this. Uh, it's not that I don't mean to, and I probably will soon, but there are so many things to do. Uh, as I said earlier, you can now increase your level to 255, and... There's also a adventure mode, which actually takes the uh, map from the Legend of Zelda, the, the original one, on the Nintendo Entertainment System, and you could go square by square doing certain puzzles with different characters. That means you have to level up your character to a certain level in order to just fight 
the people on that course, let alone live, as some of those courses are just death defying. Overall, this is a great game. Maybe if you were younger and just starting to get into hack and slash, maybe this would be your game. Although it may be easy, it could be down your alley. Next up on this list is Shovel Knight, this amazing indie game that popped up on everyone's radar about a little more than a year ago. This game features amazing original 8-bit music, and you play as Shovel Knight, using your shovel, armor, and magic to reach your Shield Knight. This game has a very nostalgic feel in the sense that you have to go around defeating 8 different knights to get back to the boss, kind of like Mega Man, and the levels themselves feel a lot like a Mega Man game. Uh, Mega Man as in back in the day Mega Man 1 through 10 and not even the X's just 1 through 10. And Shovel Knight also has an amazing thing called free DLC. And I know many of you gamers out there are like whoa free DLC it's probably just like you know the color change. Nope it's a whole nother character to play as. You can play as Plague Knight as well. Now me personally I find Plague Knight a little annoying that you gotta jump around and be an acrobat and all that but that's just me. It's a great game, although it uses the same levels, you kind of have to use a different character and you have to play the levels differently, so it adds a nice little twist. The other thing is that they said that they will be releasing other characters, in a sense tripling and even quadrupling the game. This is a very cheap game, you can find it on Steam, but more importantly on the Nintendo eShop, and you can find it for about $15. So not only is this a great buy, it's a cheap buy. And not only that, but it's a cheap buy that will keep giving back to you as they keep releasing DLC. So I definitely recommend this game. Next up on this list would be Wind Waker HD. Now this is actually the only remake to make it to my list as this is the only one that really caught my eye because it looks like they really did do a lot of work. As you can see here, side by side, this is what they look like. As you can see, they're pretty different, as you can't even see the lady's face just several yards right in front of you, versus on the HD version, you can see her face pretty far away. So they made things literally HD, high definition. So it's definitely worth the buy just for that. So the game itself though, is actually very quirky and funny, and this is the only game where, I mean, Link still doesn't talk, but he talks through his face, and if you play the game, you'll know what I mean. He has the most expressive fa uh, facial expressions throughout the entire game, to the point that you'll be laughing. Uh, the story on this is amazing, as a, it's not your generic, but it kind of is your generic Zelda kind of game. Uh, the music in this game is very soothing. It's soothing at times, it is hectic at times, it's just in general it'll suit and help push the mood of the game straight through you pretty much. This game has many puzzles, although some of them don't seem too hard. It'll take time. This isn't your hardest Zelda to play, but it will be a fun one. The dungeon this, dungeons in this are easy, but there are a lot of them. So take your time, just have fun with it. One of my biggest problems in this game is the amount of water, as you will find yourself uh, boating around everywhere. A great addition to this game though is they added the swift sail. This was not in the GameCube version, uh, this is only in the Wii U version, and pretty much when you use that sail you change the wind. In the GameCube version, every time you wanted to change your, the wind, you had to use your, uh, your wind waker rod and literally change the direction of the wind. Now, just by using that sail, you change the wind. So you don't have to take the rod out, play a song, listen to the song, put the rod back, and then sail, and then, oh wait, I needed to go just a tiny bit more west. Nope, now you just gotta bring out the sail and go, making this game much more fun. This game also has many tools that you could use. The ending fight is just pure beauty. I mean, I don't want to spoil anything, but you gotta see it. And I think the funniest tool that is in this game that is not in any other Zelda game would be the camera. You'll find yourself taking pictures of everything, everyone, and actually now that this game is in today's age with the camera, it's a little more better 
because back then there's no such thing as selfies, but you can take selfies in the game. So now you could go around taking selfies with your favorite enemies and do the selfie challenge as I have tried. This is a great game. I can highly recommend it to anyone, especially to people who have not played Wind Waker before. Next combatant on this list is Bayonetta 2, and oh my, is this a combatant. This game has amazing, crazy, beautiful graphics, and the weird thing is it's very adult. I just never would have thought Nintendo would go this route. It is extremely adult. I mean, God of War had its adult-ish times, but then it went straight back to like hack and slash let's go God of War. No, Bayonetta will make sure that you know this is an adult game every single level. There's no real nudity, and it's... There's no swearing... Well, yeah, there's a lot of swearing, what am I thinking? But it's really well done. It's not like over-the-top vulgar, but it will remind you that this is an adult game. Uh, this game is very hard if you want it to be. Unlike Hyrule Warriors, the hard setting literally is a hard setting. Although this game is a hack and slash, it does have its uh, combos, and it doesn't feel too repetitive. Even though I find myself using similar combos a lot, it's not repetitive, unlike other hack and slash. It somehow feels different. I honestly don't know how they did it, but they made this hack and slash with tons of necessary grinding not seem too bad at all. Uh, but that is a big downside for this game. You probably will be grinding, which, I mean, let's face it, it's a hack and slash RPG. You want to get better, make it easier. But the things in this game are extremely expensive. You'll be looking at 100,000 halos for a simple item, or 3,000 halos for a simple healing item. I mean, defeating a boss sometimes will only get you 1,600, so hold on to those halos. Another big downside of this game is that sometimes the cutscenes just seem like still pictures with uh, voice over, which is okay. But, I mean, most of the game is uh, actually rendered and moving as scenes like an actual game. So, for them to go to these budget cut cutscenes is kind of sad. But, on the plus side, they're still very beautiful, and they're not too long, so it doesn't get in the way. One of the other very interesting things about this game are the types of weapons. And there are swords, there are guns, flamethrowers, there's tons of stuff. You can even use some of the enemy's weapons for a short time, making this game a lot more diverse feeling. Overall, I can highly recommend it if you are okay with the adult theme. Me personally, I was looking for it, and this is a great game. Number 5 on this list is Mario Maker. This amazing game came out in September and has blown up on the internet ever since. This game allows you to do many things. It's practically the Terraria of Mario. I would say Minecraft, but it doesn't grant you 100% freedom, as you'd think. There are a few things that are weird and a few things that are not uh, correlative to the games. An example is uh, in the older games, if you do the little twirly jump, you can jump on the saw blades. You cannot do that here. But that's just a minor thing. Maybe that's me. So, there's no real story in this game. That's a pretty big downside for me, but I mean, come on. What Mario game has a really good story? The closest thing to a story in this game would be the 10 slash 100 Mario levels. As in, you get 10 or 100 lives and you have to go through 10 or 16 levels. These levels are uh, generated by the community and they're okay. I mean, if you do the easy ones, they're excessively easy. If you do the normal ones, you'll get a good batch. If you do the expert ones, you'll want to throw your controller. And that's the thing that you'll notice about this game, is that a lot of people make excessively hard, good luck, you're gonna die kind of levels. And I mean, that's okay, but there are a lot of them, which brings me to another downside. There needs to be a better level screening for this game. Uh, what I mean by that is the people who are the most famous on this are mainly YouTubers. An example would be Rubber Ross, although I'm sure he's a cool guy, he makes horrible, horrible stages. But enough of that. So let's talk about some pros, because there are tons of pros in this. I mean, at the same time as there are bad levels, there are people who make amazingly beautiful levels. One of the things that 
I've learned to do and I've seen from many people is to make music in this game. I didn't think that was possible, but there are some really crazy music levels, some of which you also have to still do stuff. It's not just one of those standstill Mario music levels, which honestly you will find a few of those. But if you can get through uh, the expert levels and some of the standalone levels, you will find some gems that are just pure bliss to play. Not to mention, you can create your own bliss for others to play, giving this game a lot of replayability and the ability to play with others over and over. The cool thing about these stages is you'll make it with one thing in mind, and then you'll hand it to someone else, and they'll just do something that you didn't even know was possible. That happens practically every time I make a stage and I show it to a friend, which ends up being pretty often nowadays. So this game will give you a lot of replayability, and this would be a great game for Christmas Day. But in the long run, I don't know how it'd hold up. You might get a little angry at it, you'll probably want to take a break from it for a few days. So that's why it's number four on the list. There are games that you will want to play just every single day. Fourth up on this list is Xenoblade Chronicles X, and with good reason, because this game is really just, it's so crazy. The best way I could explain this game, for those who haven't played it, is it's kind of like Fantasy Star Online mixed with Sword Art Online with a touch of uh, EA Games uh, Sport and that makes for a really beautiful, interesting story. You end up crash landing on this planet pretty much without giving away too much and you end up trying to find your way off well, uh, as a nation or group and there are so many things, so many people and it's all extremely well detailed. I mean, the, the last time I saw a game like this would have to be... You know, I've honestly never really seen a game like this. Uh, it's just, it's beauty, it's size, it's mechanics, it's crazy. So one thing about this game would be the learning curve. It's kind of excessive. At first I thought there were so many things that you had to do and it was so hard and detailed, but it's actually not hard, it's actually kind of time-based, so in a way it turns the game into a turn-based system without it being a turn-based system. Honestly, that's pretty genius. Uh, you get to ha choose between three separate classes that all break off into more classes, so in a way you almost get 12 classes in the end, and in the end you also get to pilot a skell, aka a mech, a giant machine. So you'll be running through these... So you'll be running through the lands, uh, six different lands, or continents as they're called, and you'll be seeing different monsters, some level 1, some level, I think the highest I've seen is 80s, so probably well in the hundreds. And you will have to do different quests, helping people, saving people, finding things, and it's all really well done. It's not like Borderlands, where it's like, hey, I lost this item, or hey, my item was stolen, can you get it back? Oh, you could keep it. That's, uh, that got boring. It's way too fast. One of the downsides of this game would be the anime style story. Although a lot of the anime style is really cool, I wish they really did not adopt the flashback saying something every couple of chapters kind of anime style. Uh, for any of those who have watched Naruto or any wrong, uh, long running anime, then you would know what I mean. Bleach, any of those with the flashback stories. They're, that'll happen in this game. Other than that, this game is just beautiful, has tons of different weapons and uh, abilities and shouts. And it's really confusing at first. It's kind of just a ridiculous amount of things to learn before you truly play the game. But there's actually a manual that comes with it. A 131 page manual. I mean, really 131 pages for a game. That is abusively long. But if you can get through that and you can figure out how to learn all the abilities, weapons, classes, uh, mechs, the shouts, and equipping your party correctly, then it's a blast. It's one of the most fun games I've played in a long while. It's really fun because you don't even have to really shoot or do anything. It's just amazing to go run through this new world. They do an amazing job with making this world seem like its own habitat and its, its own world. It's just beautiful and well done. If you get this game, it's going to be hard to put it down. And if you don't have this game, it's going to be hard to not get it. 
Next up on this list in the third place is Super Smash Bros. 4. This game has tons and tons of Nintendo characters. And by the way, they added Cloud, so PlayStation characters as well. But don't tell PlayStation that. Um, that run very smoothly, and they have very fluid movements. This is one of the few games where their movements not only make sense, but you can see the wind-up of the punches, the movements of the kicks, you can see them go from down to up, it's very, very clear, and it's just beautifully done. The music in this game is well done, it's from tons and tons of different Nintendo games. I want to say there's a couple hundred different songs, and you can actually make your own stage putting these songs to them, so it's a nice little added touch. Uh, the characters in this game are almost all super balanced. There's no real better character than the other. I mean, I know there's tons of tier list hype, but don't listen to it. It's all about how good of a player you are and how well of a player they are. There are tons of sources in this game uh, where they take their items, their characters, the music. It's just... The, this world of Super Smash Bros. is huge. Some of the uh, downsides of this game is that there are no voice chat, which I guess could be seen as a plus, because, I mean, who wants to hear a kid yell at you, say you suck, and teabag you, and all that, but at the same time, it makes it kind of hard to coordinate things with your friends. Although, to be honest, the online in this game is horrible. I personally have my Wii U plugged in with an adapter, and I still uh, find lag. I have AT&T as a internet provider, and my upload and download speed is actually pretty good. Download being around 27, and upload being around 2 megabits per second. I shouldn't be having as many problems as I am. Now maybe it's them having problems and I'm just kind of seeing the repercussions, but when, I, when you play as a Sheik player and you need to tap the character you know, 50,000 times just to kill them, you need no lag. If there's any lag, you're not going to want to play. So, that's a really big problem for me. Another uh, decently sized problem that made this game not the, to uh, the top of the list would be that it has no real story. It's just kind of go fight, go brawl. In uh, Brawl in Smash Bros. 3, there was a subspace emissary, and that was actually a really cool, nicely tied story that put all these characters in the same kind of setting. Now, there's just a uh, go fight crazy hand, or faster hand, oh, okay. go do all star smash, it's like, it's okay, but I think Smash Bros. kind of lost its uh, uniqueness, it's now just go smash, go destroy, which I guess is okay, but I don't want Smash to turn into another Mario game, and that is why it's kind of number three, I love this game, but it's not number one. Number two on this list may come to a surprise to many people, but it is Super Mario 3D World. This game came out with the Wii, if I recall, and it is actually a great game to come with the Wii, and it stands the test of time. Oh, time as in the couple of years the Wii's been out. In this game, there are about eight worlds, well, in the main storyline, and if you are a completionist, I believe there are about 11 or 12 worlds. But it's really hard to get to that point because you need to get the flagpole tops, the stars, and the stamps. All of them. Everything. 100%. I am almost there, and I am in the process of getting there, and trust me, it's it takes a lot. I didn't think it would take so much, but I'm hoping that the end result will be worth it. In this game, though, you can play with friends and by yourself. Me, personally, I usually play with friends. Uh, this is actually the first time you're seeing now me with myself just to get the footage. Uh, the worlds in this game are not too repetitive. There are a couple times where you could tell they took their ideas from a different world and just kind of made it harder and brought it to a new one, but that doesn't happen that, happen that often. Uh, the characters in this game are a lot like Super Mario Bros. 2 or Doki Doki Panic, uh, in the sense that you have your Peach, Toad, Luigi, Mario, and if you beat the game, you get Rosalina, and that's actually really cool. All of these characters have their own uh, pros and cons. Maybe they'll be faster, but they won't have a big jump, or maybe they can float, but they'll be slow. In the end, they're all good in their own way, and you might want to use different ones for different levels, as some levels have certain things that are only attainable by specific characters. You'll need to get Peach to float over and hit a Peach button or something to get a star. 
uh, the music in this game is just beautiful. I mean, jazzy, new. I, I mean, it's Nintendo's really good at remaking music, but they overdid themselves here with that. Da, 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 da. This game is a great adventure with tons and tons of features that you can just play for hours on end with friends or by yourself. And not only that, but there are tons of new items in this game. That's the thing I really, I think a good game requires. At least a, a remake or a continuation of the storyline would be new features. Uh, in this one, there's the cat suit, and that allows you to climb up things like Little Kitty, and you just look cute as hell. Uh, there are returning items like the cherry, fire flower, uh, I believe the ice flower is in there, and those are all really cool, and they really help enrich the story of this game. Uh, some of the downsides of this game would be the camera can be not your friend, and actually your friends can be not your friend, as it's really easy to kill other people. But there is a glitch to get tons and tons of lives, and you will want to do that if you have friends. Overall, this game is amazing, and for a holiday buy, I don't know if there's much better. There is a game that is better than this one, but for a group family game, this would be it. But with its flaws of camera, and in the end still just being another Mario game, it made it number two. Number one is a totally crazy whole new monster. So the top of this list and your best buy for this holiday season would have to be Splatoon. This game has tons of weapons and gears, and several maps that you get to play. Uh, the downside of the maps would be that you only get to choose to be thrown into one of two maps and those maps change every four hours. I believe there's about eight or nine different maps so far but you only get to be thrown into two. A huge huge amazing plus, plus side of this game that you've heard me talk about before would be free DLC. This game gets DLC almost every single week. May it be a new weapon, a new uh, map, new type of gear, but there's always something new in this game. This game is all about staying fresh. In the online version of this game, you play as an inkling competing for either a tower for tower control to get into the other person's base, you compete for the Rainmaker to try to get that into the other uh, team's base, or Splat Zones trying to make specific zones your color, or Turf War, which is all about making all of the turf your color. In the offline portion of the game, you're playing as Agent 3, trying to get the Zapfish back to your nation. Uh, the Zapfish is needed for powering most of the city, but that's besides the point. Uh, in the offline portion, you actually go around from level to level trying to get to the end, or, or trying to get to the end where uh, little baby Zapfish can be found. These levels aren't really big, and the story isn't all that important, but the cool thing about all of the offline is it teaches you about online. Uh, all the way down to the final boss. The final boss has several of the abilities that Inklings can use when they fill up their charge. And honestly, that final boss might be the best boss fight I have had in a game for a good long time. Possibly forever, but at, for a good long time. I can't think of anything better right now. Some of the downsides of this game, as I said earlier, would be the maps. Uh, you only get thrown into one of two, but that's if you wanted to play unranked. If you wanted to play ranked, there's another two maps you could get thrown in, making a total of four different maps. But the ranked are crazy, and it's a uh, makes your heart pound with stress, because those things get crazy. People get really intense, and it will sometimes go into overtime. <laughs> This online game has overtime, it's not like clear cut like any other shooter. There's crazy overtime that sometimes you'll be angry because you lost a very strenuous six minute game because they got one point after the timer. Another downside of this game would be voice chat, but again, maybe Nintendo has an idea and that could be a plus side. Because there is voice chat if you're playing with friends, there's just no voice chat if you're playing with public. Overall, this game got number one because of great music, new everything, new ideology, weapons, everything. It's a great online and offline game. You can play with friends or with the public. So overall, this 
is your general number one buy. This would be a great gift for anyone and everyone. I don't know a person this would not be a good game for. 